I'm here to talk to you about how to hear God's call, spiritual disciplines. Um, before we get into that too far, though, just out of curiosity, what do you guys like to do for fun? What do you do for fun? Exercise. Exercise, like what? Um, like calisthenics, like push-ups, pull-ups. Okay. I do one sit-up a day. <laughs> I get up in the morning. That's half. I lay down at the end of each day. That's the other half. So, um, as you can tell, I've worked very hard on my physique, um, which is probably a bad thing, and the bishop's probably going to get on me about that. So, um, let's move on. What else do you guys do for fun? Paint. All righty. What do you like to paint? Um, mostly music and instrument. Music and instrument. Okay. Anything else? What else do you guys like to do? Movies. Movies. Wonderful. What kind of movies do you like? Everything? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Play paintball. Play paintball. Okay. That's a great example. Okay. F- to play paintball, what do you need to play paintball? Gear. You need gear, like protective equipment. No. <laughs> you don't mind getting plastered with paint pellets then? No. no. But you need a gun because you're not throwing paintballs, are you? <laughs> He's not helping me very much, is he? All right, let's go with this. One of the things I love to do, and and it's probably showing my age a little bit, I love to golf, okay? And when we talk about spiritual disciplines, if you don't use these spiritual disciplines, it's like trying to play golf with just your putter, okay? It's like going, if you don't practice spiritual disciplines, it's like playing the game of life with just your putter. It'll take an awfully long time. It makes things very difficult. So why are they important? Well, This is, you know, this is, I don't want to waste your time. This is to answer like, okay, so what? Why do we do these things? Well, there are a couple of different things. We're going to focus on four. First one is, their spiritual disciplines help us to grow with God, okay? Spiritual disciplines help us to grow with God. They, um, whether or not you want to call it a relationship or a leadership uh, relationship kind of a thing with God, it, it helps put God into your terms, okay? It helps you to know God better. They help us to develop our relationship. They help us to learn the Bible more and more. Um, They increase our knowledge. They increase just, you know, for lack of a better term, our intimacy with God. It's just very important. But not only do they help us grow with God, do spiritual disciplines help us to grow with others, okay? Over and over and over again in the Bible, we see this, um, they see these relationships work hand in hand. It's not just a vertical relationship with God that we're focusing on. But God affirms time and time again that we also have a relationship with each other. You know, when Jesus said, when Jesus talked about the greatest commandments, the first one is to love the Lord your God, but the second is to love your neighbors as yourself. And so there is a a vertical relationship that we're working on, but also a a horizontal relationship that we're working on. Next thing, uh, spiritual, spiritual disciplines help us to avoid and respond to sin, okay? Some of these are very targeted to uh, specific sins and uh, to respond to them, to avoid them, to give us tools to combat the temptation that they may present for us. And finally, um, the last one is to discern God's direction, okay? And that's what you're here for. The problem, the, the issue that we have with discernment is it's not often very difficult, not because you got the good angel and the evil devil, but you got the good angel and the good angel. You're often choosing between two goods, you know, and that's a very difficult thing. You know, we were talking about seminaries and, you know, what one to choose and, you know, whether or not to choose to go to Duke or to uh, um, MTSO in Ohio or Asbury, you know, all these seminaries are good places to learn more about God. And so you're not choosing between you know, a seminary that is God and a seminary that's of the devil, you're choosing between two very God-honoring places. And that presents a very difficult task, especially in terms of deciding what God is calling you to do, which as uh, Kathy talked about this morning, God calls us, God calls everyone to something. God calls everyone to something. And what your task is, is to discern whether or not God is calling you to a special form of ministry that is ordained ministry and so that's what these tools help us to address now we're going to separate these into two categories the first one are disciplines of engagement you can keep hit the next button and i'm a a star trek nerd i'm a sci-fi geek okay 
and that is Jean-Luc Picard of the Starship Enterprise. And anytime he sets a course, he says, engage. And, and so that's why I have his picture up there. I, I love Star Trek. I'm going through Star Trek Voyager right now on Netflix. It's, it's wonderful. So disciplines of engagement, okay? Um, they, these are kind of sort of obvious things. These are practices where you do something. These are practices where you do something. What are some examples that you can think of maybe that are, spirit, that are disciplines of engagement? Yep. Fasting. Fasting. Hey, this is to keep you engaged. Piece of candy. <laughs> That's a little ironic. <laughs> but it is what it is. Okay. Spirit, fasting. Yes. Uh, what else? Doing missionary work. Doing missionary work. Service. There you go. And if you don't like what you got, you can trade later. <laughs> Daily devotions, wonderful. We'll talk about some of these in more detail in a second. One more. Prayer, prayer. lovely. How to take, it took us four to get to prayer. Okay. That, that, that's something we'll have to address at some other point. <coughs> Excuse me. As you can hear, I'm trying to get over a cold. Uh, having kids is a wonderful thing, and they share love with you, but also many, many germs. So I'm trying to get over them. Um, so we'll talk about, those are just some, we're going to talk about a couple of generic ones because we don't have time to go into all of them. I have 45 minutes and that's just not enough time to go into all of them. So we're going to highlight a few in a little bit here. The second category are disciplines of rest. We can go ahead. And that's my daughter, Arabella. That's when she was probably about a month old. So she's now two. So, so I just thought that she, it's one of the cutest pictures. I love that picture for yawning. Um, so disciplines of rest. These are times where you just take, or practices where you rest from something. And actually, you said fasting. Fasting would actually be considered a discipline of rest. Not, okay. So fasting would be an example of discipline of rest. What are some, what might be some other examples of disciplines of rest? Yes. Meditation. Meditation. What else? Uh, that's more discipline of engagement, but I'll give you candy anyway. What else? She said, uh, uh, you said fellowship, right? My head is clogged with medicine. Um, yes, she said fellowship, which is more of a discipline of engagement. That's engaging in others. What else? Uh, a vow of silence. Silence. There we go. These are a little less intuitive. These vows of rest, these uh, disciplines of rest, they're a little less intuitive. We're not quite as much familiar with them. Um, they're a little less obvious. You know, some basic course might be taking a retreat, you know, resting from our prevailing culture that is around us, um, silent. Um, there's also the big one that a lot of people do, whether or not, and I find this fascinating, whether or not they participate in a Christian church or a, a church of any kind, is the whole Lent tradition of giving up something for Lent each and every year. And so whether, and I hear a lot of people do that and they have no connection to a church at all whatsoever, but they still do it during Lent for some strange reason. So that's one of those things where you're taking a rest from. Um, so we're going to talk about some, so each of the, we're going to highlight some specific ones. The first, we're going to talk about disciplines of engagement. The first one we'll talk about is worship. So worship, and I could use some volunteers to look up these three scriptures. Can I get somebody for Psalm 139 verse 14? Thank you. Can I get somebody for Exodus 15, verse 20? Thank you. And 2 Samuel 6, 12 through 16. Thank you. Go ahead and look those up for me, please. Wonderful. How are we doing here, guys? Are you ready to go? Yeah. Go ahead. This is, you have Psalm 139, correct? Yep, 139. All right, go ahead. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Thank you for reading scripture. Oh, okay, go ahead. Then Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Yes, worship, dancing. I don't dance in church because it's just ugly. I don't do dancing. But if you want to dance, feel free. 
Uh, the Lord said you could make a joyful noise, not ugly dancing steps. Um, so Second Samuel chapter six. I'm really confused with this one. Okay, did I have a typo? I don't know. The King David was told. No, Lord, you're right. The Lord has blessed Obadiah's home and everything he has, be- and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went there and brought the ark to the city of David with a great celebration. After the men who were carrying it had gone six steps, they stopped and waited so David could sacrifice an ox and a fattened calf. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly tunic. So David and all Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with much shouting and blowing of trumpets. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. When she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she was filled with contempt for him. Okay. That last sentence, we could, where it goes into a different context. But these different verses talk about different ways that we worship, okay? It's not just, you know, sitting in the... It's not always sitting in church and we stand up and we do the call to worship and we sit down or we sing a hymn or we sing a praise song or we have keyboards. Worship encompasses a variety of different contexts, a variety of different things that you can do. But it is a basic discipline that we need to do not only to engage in God... But again, to engage with each other, Um, we must connect with others to be the church. If somebody were to ask me, you know, do you really need to go to church in order to be a Christian? Uh, I would say to them, almost, I'm almost assuredly sure that the answer is yes, because you don't find, you find so much through the scripture, the value God has for the fellowship of that we have with each other. You cannot just be an island unto yourself and have the basis uh, and ha- be a strong valued Christian because there is a necessity in Christianity in the in the word of God to relate to each other not just in worship but in other things but this is one of the primary components is that there is something to worshiping with each other and worshiping God with each other as Jesus said where two or more gather in my name there I am in their midst okay and that's very important for us to remember um, some suggested practices um, that you might consider, and we'll have some suggested practices for, for all the ones we're talking about. This one is not that hard, and that means being a part of a congregation you connect with. And this can be incredibly difficult during the college years. During the college years, it can be very difficult to maintain a solid connection with the church. Um, I, went, I lived and grew up in Harrisburg. I went to school at Penn State, and it was very difficult to maintain that connection to my church at home in, in uh, Linglestown in Harrisburg. So I had to invest in a different church. And so I invested in at St. Paul's UMC there right in the center of town at, at State College and participated in the Wesley Student Fellowship that we have right there, right next to the church. And so you need to find some sort of connection to express this worship, to express this connection that we have with God in the context of other believers. So it's just, I can't, over, I can't under, underestimate what, or underemphasize, overemphasize how important this aspect is, especially in the college age years, to maintain this idea of fellowshipping with one another, to worshiping God in the context of a congregation. It's just a crucial thing. Okay. The second one is prayer. There's another biggie. Okay. So we have two more scriptures: James five verses thirteen through sixteen. If I can get a volunteer. How about somebody else? I would, let's try to spread this around. Thank you, James 5, 13 through 16. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Thank you very much. And so when we talk about prayer, we're going to talk about different forms of prayer. There's prayers of gratitude. There's prayers of praise. There's prayers of confession. There's prayers for petitions, petitioning God. You know, I, you know going to God with what is on our heart, um, what we desire and going to God and, and, and seeing how God's desires and our desires mesh together. How can we make that work? And what is it that's on our hearts? Um, you know, and, and some of these, it's not always going to get the answer you want. Um, this is especially to, you know, when you're visiting folks in hospitals. Um, you know, I oversee our congregational care team at my church. And so I uh, recruit and train volunteers to do uh, for our visitation team. And so we have volunteers that go in and visit people in the hospitals when they're in there or people that are homebound. And the one thing we consistently talk about is you can 
pray for healing, but you always have to pray for God's will. And so I often, one of the, one of the things that I advise them to do, one of the things I consistently do when I'm praying with somebody um, in that context, in a hospital or something like that, is most often or not just pray for, for uh, patients, praying uh, for the caregivers, for wisdom for them. And, and so prayer is not always going to necessarily give us what we want. We're always supposed to go to God with our desires and pray that God enlightens us as to how they fit with his desires. And that's a part of the process of prayer. And so we're going to hear some things about prayer here. Let's go with James 5, verses 13 through 16. Go ahead. All right. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of prayer. <coughs> Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil, offered in faith. Oh, sorry. Oil in oil in the name of the Lord. I jumped around. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray. For pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Thank you. Over your head. Oh, there we go. Nice catch. And I think what James is really communicating to us there is, in many ways, there is no such thing as a prayer that is too small. That God is a deeply personal God. And whatever is on our hearts, he wants us to bring to God. We want, we want to bring that to God, whatever is on our hearts. How big or how small. Um, for, for years when I was single after college, I was praying for God to send me a woman so I could date. And I missed that companionship. And God, you know, I'm ready to move on with my life. I'm ready to get married. And the funny thing is, I already knew my, what, who, my wife, who my wife would eventually become. She was already in my life, and I just didn't see it. And I continue to try to look for it in other places. And so, you know, no matter how big or small, whatever is on your heart, God wants you to bring to him, no matter what it is. And so we need to make sure we continue to do this, continue to pray. Um, Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. This should sound familiar, hopefully. Pray them like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also for, have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Wonderful. Here you go. Don't hit the bishop. Don't hit the bishop. Okay. Um, I, the, that, and that again, that obviously is the Lord's Prayer. And that is a great model for us because the Lord's Prayer covers just so many different things. Understanding where our relationship is in, um, in context with God, um, hallowed, holy is God's name. Um, God, your will be done. Um, you know, forgive, Lord, help me to forgive others as you have forgiven me. All these different things are just, just some, some things to bring to mind what it is that we can pray about. And help, prayer helps us to affirm who God is and who we are. And it's incomplete without time being spent listening for God. So often when we go to pray, it's God, blah, 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 help me, blah, 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 Lord, I need this, blah, 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 amen, and then we go off. So much about prayer is missing if we do not then spend some time in the still silence, which can be extremely uncomfortable. Um, I'm one of those people, I can't stand silence. I fall asleep with the TV on because I can't stand silence. Um, it just uh, drives me batty, but I've been trying to cultivate a spirit of silence more and more in my spiritual disciplines because, um, there is something to being still and, and letting God, God's spirit just sort of fill that void and lead us. In, and that's often where we hear God's voice so much because, because so often we try to fill it with other things and we fill this time and we fill that time. And sometimes we just need to take a break. And we'll get to that in a little bit, what that means for us too. So, you know, some, some suggested practices, praying and sharing your prayers with others. That's really important to share your prayers with others so they can pray for you, so they can, so they can know what's going on with your life. I mean, this is really crucial stuff. Uh, praying, or perhaps if you find yourself kind of wandering as you're praying, something you might want to do is pray while you walk or walk in a certain pattern or something like that, or have something in your hand um, that can kind of guide your prayer time. Um, if you find yourself just so wandering during your times of prayer, make sure you set aside a personal time to pray each day. That's really important. Just set some, 
set set aside in, in the beginning, maybe just set aside five minutes and maybe, you, you know, after a couple of weeks of that, you can go to 10 minutes and then 15 minutes, but make sure you set that side, that time aside each day. Uh, next one, daily devotions and scripture reading kind of combine these two together. Let's just do uh, one of the verses here. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 3, verses 14 through 17. Thank you. So this is daily devotions and scripture reading. This is setting, setting aside some time each day to spend focusing on God and the word. You'll find this acting in, in concert with uh, prayer, that, that some setting aside some time each day to really focus in on God, to bring that time of focus to God. Are you ready to go? Awesome. Go ahead. But don't let it faze you. Stick with what you have learned and believed. Be sure of the integrity of your teachers. Why you took the sacred scriptures with your mother's milk. There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Every part of scripture is God breathed in useful ways, one way or another, showing us the truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word we are put together and shaped up for the task God has for us. Wonderful. Here you go. Oh, um, now, this all, I know, probably sounds great. Spending some time with God each and every day probably sounds wonderful. What's, what's a big problem with that, though? What can you think might be a huge obstacle to making this happen? Yes. Our schedule. Schedules. Thank you for participating. Have a three musketeers. Um, schedules. We, are, we live in an overcommitted society. I mean, I encounter this uh, trying to get small groups started in our church. Not that... The parents are too busy, but the kids are too busy. The, the, the parents have overscheduled their kids, and so they may have one kid at baseball on Wednesday night, and their daughter is in gymnastics on Thursday night, and then they have choir for school on Tuesday, and by the time you get done, there is no time available. And we just have done this to ourselves over and over and over again. And so I encourage you now, to start this practice, to make sure you set a time, some sacred time that is not touched. And we'll get to this towards the very end of our time together. But it's just so crucially important to start this now because as life happens, it's going to get harder and harder. Because before you know it, maybe some of you get married and then maybe you, those of you who get married will have kids and then you got their schedules and your spouse's schedule and the church's schedule if you decide to go into ministry and you have all this different stuff. And you find yourself without any time to, to spend on something that's really important like daily devotions. And to be honest, give yourself some wiggle room too. I mean, my goal is five out of seven days. That's my goal, five out of seven days. It would be wonderful if I could do that every single day. But my goal is five out of seven days. And that gives yourself a little bit of wiggle room when life kind of happens, which is bound to happen when you're serving a church. So some suggested practices for you here. Devotional booklets or books. There's all sorts of different books. It's probably probably the biggest section in a Christian bookstore is the devotional section. But there's more than just books. You have email devotions. You can get devotions emailed to you. There's an app for that for those of you who have smartphones and iPads like I do. I mean, there's all sorts of different things to help remind you and to develop your uh, daily devotional time. Um, I, I, I do have a small caution in this, and that is... Be careful about reading single verses. A lot of these bring together just some single verse, maybe a single memory verse. And just a word of caution with memorizing a single verse is that can bring it incredibly out of context. And so what I always advise people to do, especially in terms of spending time in Scripture, never just read one verse. Read the whole context so you really understand what it is you're reading. Understand what, what, it, what that Scripture is trying to communicate. Um, next one here is journaling and daily examinations, which again can be part of this whole daily practice. Philippians 1 verses 9 through 10. Can I get a volunteer? Somebody, I, I'm really strong. I want to make sure we get somebody, you know, somebody who hasn't done it. Thank you very much. So this is Philippians 1 verses 9 through 10. Um, like I said, again, this is all can be done in a set time. 15 minutes a day can knock several of these out. If, and if you're able to spend more time with it, then do more time with it. Um, so it's just basically taking some time to record and to respond to what you read and encounter and, and encounter with God during your daily devotional time. So you ready? Go ahead. 
And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Okay, the way we develop and and deepen our relationship is not just to read scripture, read a little short little passage and and then forget about it. Journaling and taking some time to examine yourself really kind of develops and deepens that whole time that you've spent. You don't want to waste your time. So take some time to reflect on the scripture you've read. Take some time to reflect on what it is God is leading you to do in that moment or in that day or what God has laid out for you in the day ahead. You know, so some things you can do is, you know, make sure you have a journal with your Bible. Perhaps maybe it's, you know, I know it's not quite so much in vogue as it was, you know, five years ago, but start your own blog or use a, use notes on Facebook or something just to kind of just, you know, really kind of develop and write out what you're thinking. You know, if you are considering call to ministry, there is so much more writing than you can ever imagine. And so now is the time to perhaps start that practice of getting better at communicating and writing. And this can be one way to do that. And the last two things are kind of related. The, the next one here is called self-care. Um, and this is, and, the, and um, this, uh, keep going. Next, next slide. That's okay. Self-care. Um, and so what we have here is a little cartoon with the dog by the self-help books. Um, the book says, stop circling and make a decision. Okay. So how to take care of yourself. Okay. This is really important. How to take care of yourself. Okay. Glad to know the dog joking. If you haven't ever owned a dog, all they do is like to circle around until they decide where it is they're going to do their business. And so um, if I can have somebody read for me 1 Corinthians uh, Corinthians 6, verses 19 through 20. Thank you. And then ways to kind of work ahead. Can I have somebody else look up 1 Corinthians 12, verses 20 through 25? Thank you very much. That's 1 Corinthians 12, verses 20 through 25. And we'll use that here in a second. So this is self-care. This is seeing yourself as having value, understanding that God values you. And so you should value yourself. So combat the ways that maybe sometimes people can bring you down or combat you or tell you you're not quite as worthy as God sees that you have worthy. This also means seeing your body as having value. Are you ready to go, Aaron? Go ahead. What? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? which you have of God, and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, so part of this is understanding that you have a mission, that God has a mission for you to do, and you can't do that if your body is wasting away. And so this means in many ways exercising and eating sensibly, um, you know, trying to make sure that you're taking good care of yourself, means make sure you have relationship boundaries so you take care of yourself emotionally so you don't over invest in someone or become codependent on a relationship or on a human relationship of some sort though you're so dependent on this other person that you have made this other person you're in a relationship with an idol which can really happen far quicker than you realize in a significant other relationship so make sure you have those kind of boundaries it means taking some time to rest and keeping the sabbath which we're going to talk about that later here in a second And it means recognizing and practicing your spiritual gifts. Basically understanding that, yes, God has given you spiritual gifts, and so God wants you to use those. And so you are a valued part of God's ministry, whether you're ordained or not. This is a part of who you are as as a brother and sister in Christ. And the next one is kind of similar to this, and that's group care. Um, Can you read that scripture for me, please? 1 Corinthians 12, verses 20 through 25. Um, as it is, there are many parts but one body. If the eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be the weaker, weaker are indispensable, and that the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And that the parts that are unpresentable are pre- treated as special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that it is part should have equal concern for each other. Okay, and so what that scripture teaches us is that, oh, this is a really old picture. 
This is my group of friends that I've grown up with, and I'm still friends with almost everyone in this picture, except for the girl sitting next to me who's an ex-girlfriend, so just ignore that. But um, everyone else, my brother is in that picture. Uh, one of my best friends is sitting right in front of me, who I still talk with, and he's actually going through a divorce right now, and so being trying to help him as best I can. It, I can't emphasize enough how important fellowship is. My wife's sister's in this picture, actually. She's the one on the edge of the couch. Um, so uh, it, it's just really important, and I'm still friends with this. And this is, I believe, 10 years ago. Um, and I'm still friends with all these folks. And at that point, we had known each other. The uh, Obviously, I've known my brother most of my life. He's only a year younger than me. But uh, the guy with the real goofy smile on the front, I've known him my entire life. We grew up in the, church, in the, in the same church together, and we still talk and hang out. Um, I can't emphasize enough how important group care is to invest yourself in a group. Because as we said, each of us has spiritual gifts and abilities that God wants us to use. And as the scripture said, those are meant to be practiced in the context of a body. And if we're not participating in the body of Christ, that means other people are missing us. That there is a void left unfulfilled because we're not doing what it is that God has asked us and and desires us to do. And so we all need to participate in some way, shape or form, because if we don't, then there's a void in other people's lives and the ministries of God that is meant for us to fill. Okay, so, you know, some of these things, I mean, you can form a small group, which is a part of a church. You can form a small group amongst friends. I mean, this is what we were. We were friends that we just continue. We grew up in youth group together. We continue to hang out. We've gotten each other through a lot of hard times. Um, we got into each other through great times. You know, some of us have kids and, you know, being helping us through that process. And like I said, my one friend right now is going through a divorce. And so we're trying to be there for him and do the best we can to get him through um, this very sad time that's going on in his life. Next thing is service, um, which we talked about a little bit. I'm actually going to try to cycle through these a little bit quicker because we're running out of time and I have only four minutes left. So service here, you have a scripture. I'm not going to look those up. You can look those up on your own. This is engaging your gifts and strengths and mission and ministry. We've talked about this, that we're all called to to some form of mission or ministry, whether it's ordained or not, is what these help you to decide, including serving. And sometimes serving and, and deploying your spiritual gifts and abilities is a little bit of trial and error. You know, giving something a shot and seeing if it works. And, you know, whenever I talk to somebody who's in, interested in youth ministry, when I used to be a youth pastor, I wouldn't have, when somebody came to me and said, I want to be involved in the youth ministry, I didn't sign them up to be a small group leader that day. You know, that's not what you want to do. You give them, give them a little bit of a taste. You bring them to a retreat or to creation or to a fellowship event and just see how they interact. Um, you know, and, and some contexts are great and some aren't. Um, our one youth leader was great in small group ministry, but couldn't stand going on retreats because he didn't like all the pranks that went on. It was, it was just not his cup of tea. He thought that was just not what he was up for. Um, so, but he was great in, in terms of being a small group and being, and helping a, a small group. Um, so understand your spiritual gifts. We talked about spiritual inventories this morning already. Um, so that, so all these different things help us to go. Those are disciplines of engagement. Quickly here, disciplines of rest, retreating, solitude, silence. These kind of all go hand in hand. And that means resting from our culture, resting from sound, resting from other people's company. I know we spent a lot of time talking about how important it is that we relate to each other. But there is some time where we need to just disconnect ourselves from all of our relationships to more fully focus on, on God. Okay, um, so the next one is unplugging. You find some, you find that scripture there. That means perhaps uh, you know you unplug all these devices, your iPads, your phones. You turn them off. You let them go. You don't respond to them, just to be able to really more fully engage in your relationship with God and whatever spiritual discipline you're going to be practicing um, in concert with that. The next one is fasting, which we talked about. Um, yes, fasting does not doesn't mean eating fast food. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, fasting, it's not just necessarily in terms of food, but it can be in terms of other things as well. Fasting from a particular kind of food, that sort of thing. An important thing here is you don't advertise what it is you're doing. I mean, Scripture over and over again said, it tells us very clearly that when you do these things, it's supposed to be between you and God. This isn't time to advertise the fact, I'm giving up chocolate for Lent. 
and aren't you so proud of me? It's not a bragging time. It's about quietly doing something that's going to bring your life in more focus with God, okay? And finally is the Sabbath, and this is the one I really wanted to spend some time on um, if we can. God, if God needs one day out of seven to rest, then so do you. And it really, this is one of my personal um, sort of soapboxes is I can't stand it when I go to or talk to somebody or especially those we just did our D, we doing, we did the first half of our DCOM district committee interviews for candidates of ministry. And, you know, we can consi- I consistently ask, you know, what day do you spend resting? And this is very important and you need to do this now because the longer you wait to pick a day where you don't do anything involving work or anything like that where you take some time to simply rest and work on your relationship with God and perhaps work on your relationship with God with others, your family or friends or whoever. It's going to get harder to do this the longer you wait. It's going to get harder to do this the longer you wait. Right now, my day of rest is Friday. So I don't respond to any phone calls from people from the church on Friday. I don't respond to any emails from people from the church on Friday. Nothing. I take that day of rest and completely unplug. If there's an emergency, they'll leave a message and I'll check the message. And if it's something that needs my immediate attention, you know, somebody's in the hospital and we're going to unplug this person from life support. Can you please come in to pray? That's, that's an emergency situation that I need to go and take care of. But I make sure I get that time of rest some other time the following week. But I go and take care of it. Um, but you need to start this practice now because the longer you wait, the harder it is. And so make sure you take a day of rest, no matter what it is. Just make sure you do this. I can't emphasize this enough. If you don't do this, you can get burnt out very quickly. You can lose your energy without realizing that you're not taking care of yourself. So make sure you pick the same day every week. That's something that you need to do. Because if you flip flop it every week, then it becomes then it's hard for the church to hear or whoever it is you're relating to. Um, It's hard for them to understand. Um, it, It just makes things a whole lot clearer. But you need to do this. You need to make sure you keep that Sabbath day holy.